I don't know if you've had my experience, but uh, I decided to put a, an underground sprinkling system in our garden and bury the pipes and all that kind of thing, you know, and I worked hard at it, and I've worked hard at it for about three years, and now have it just, <laughs> it's, it's just dead right now. It goes on seven o'clock in the morning without me bothering everything, except that this summer you don't need it. <laughs> it's one of the wettest summers we've ever had. And it's interesting that, that uh, last winter was probably one of the coldest winters we've ever had in Minnesota. And yet the amazing fact is that uh, we knew they were coming, didn't we? We knew that the winter was going to be very cold, that's what they said, and we knew that the summer was going to be very wet. And it's all due to this new technique that is called long-range weather forecasting. And it is just unbelievably accurate. I don't know how they do it. I, I suppose it's partly because we understand weather patterns better than we did before. And that enables us to do these even seven-year forecasts. I suppose also the, the space satellites must help those uh, satellites that give us the pictures that we see on the TV forecast now. Uh, I suppose you're able to get further back from the Earth and you can see more of the global air currents that affect our climate. And so you're able to give longer forecasts. And then, I don't know, but I would think that the computers help. You, you get all the observations that you've had for years past and all the present observations and you feed them all into a computer and I suppose the computers produce probability curves that are far more accurate than anything our human minds could produce. Yet it's interesting to think, isn't it, if you could get further back from the Earth even than our space satellites, in fact, if you could get way back from the whole universe and you could look at it from a great distance. The amazing thing is, Einstein pointed out to us that if you could get far enough back like that, future and past would all melt into one great eternal present, and you'd see everything, both what was to come in the future and what had been in the past, you'd see it all in one great present moment. Of course, if you could do that, then you would be able to see the air currents of all the solar systems, and you would be able to see how all those affect our particular atmosphere. Then it's interesting if you had a mind that was more refined than any of our computers. It would be so complex that it could process all this observation and all these facts perfectly. And then, of course, if you knew the inner essence of wind and sun and air currents and the movement of the stars, and you knew how they all affected each other, you could probably forecast the weather for the whole of the universe for all of its history. Is there anyone in that position? Well, only one. There's only one in a position to do that. And loved ones, that's why we said last Sunday that our Creator, who fulfills all those conditions, and is in exactly that position in regard to the universe and to all our lives, that's why we said, God is able to foreknow 
all of our lives, even though He doesn't make them happen in a certain way. He's able to foreknow them even though He has built free will into the whole of the universe. Now, it might be good, you know, for those of you who still have trouble with the whole idea of foreknowledge, just to see it in the light of what even we puny human beings can do with our relatively crude equipment, to what extent we can foreknow things, and to what extent people like Einstein have even been able to show us what we would be able to do if we could get far enough away. It's much more reasonable to believe that, yes, somebody in God's position could certainly foreknow the events that have taken place day by day in our lives and in the lives of the nations. Now, maybe you'd look at that verse just so that we, we start back there, loved ones. It's, it's that verse in Romans chapter 11. Romans 11 and verse 2. It's page 985, Romans 11 and verse 2. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. You see, that's where you get that mention of God's foreknowledge. That even though God hasn't made the things happen, hasn't foreordained them, he can read us like a book and he can foreknow and extrapolate from the present facts what is going to happen and what we're most likely to do. And then let's look at an incredible fact that is very powerful in the second half of the verse. Do you not know what the Scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Do you not know what the Scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Now, just take my word for it. There's a great truth in here that you'll see in a, in a few minutes. Maybe the best way to approach it is this. Do you all know what's happening at this moment, uh, just back there? Well, back there in the hole in the wall is a TV camera, and it's videotaping at this moment all that I'm saying. And the amazing thing is, of course, that even though it's videotaping it at the moment, here in Minneapolis, the sermon will probably not be seen by us on our Channel 5 for about another four weeks. So even though the camera is, is filming this all now at about 11.43 on uh, July the 29th, yet this won't be seen by us on Channel 5 for about another four weeks. And probably in California and uh, in uh, Virgin Islands, San Diego, probably not for maybe another six or seven weeks because it is all just being videotaped. Now, another thing you might not know is that we have an editing machine, because it's very difficult for me to talk like this anyway naturally and spontaneously and make it last just exactly 27 minutes and 30 seconds every Sunday. <laughs> and that's what it has to last to fit into the half-hour TV slot. So it's difficult to do that. And we have an editing machine by which we at times cut some of the sentences out of the sermon that we can do without, so that we get the time right for telecasts. But the editing machine is so accurate that it can freeze me in the middle of a word. And so, yeah, you can stop in the word bored and you could make it a different word at the end than what it started out as. So, of course, if old John Spaulding or, or Betty Jo or some of the other television crew members had the time during the week, they could actually take out every mistake and every error in all my sermons. And so I could sit at home in about four weeks' time and watch myself on television producing a flawless sermon. 
Now, naturally, since I'm Irish, I do that anyway. So <laughs> I don't need these electronic marvels. <laughs> but it is incredible, isn't it, to think that even we can produce a version of life that has all the errors and the flaws taken out of it. And you would be fascinated, you know, to see the, the television people back there sitting at this editing console, and they have the original videotape showing up on one screen, and just by hitting buttons, they can concoct and put together a perfect videotape on the other screen with all the errors and all the flaws taken out. And it is fascinating to see them do that, you know. It's almost as if you're creating a perfect version of life right there just by pressing buttons. And yet, why do we doubt for a moment? When we consider that, and we consider the miracle of instant replay, which we ha cannot do, whereby you remember you run a live telecast about five seconds delay after the event's taking place on camera, so that you can actually telecast the thing live, except that it's a few seconds later than it's actually happening in the studio. And so you can make corrections almost as the thing happens. Now, why, when we ourselves, at this relatively early stage of our scientific development, we can produce a perfect version of life almost simultaneously with life itself. Why do we doubt for a moment that God, who can forecast the whole of the universe's weather for the whole of its existence, why do we doubt that He can foreknow and has foreknown the whole course of each one of our lives here in this room, lived apart from Him with all their errors, all their ingrained, incorrigible habits, and that He Himself has put them into His Son Jesus in the timeless sphere of eternity and has destroyed that old, error-filled, fault-filled version of our lives, and has recreated in Jesus' resurrection a version of us that is perfect. Why do we doubt it? You know? I mean, why do we even hesitate on it? We treat that as if it's some kind of unbelievable miracle, and yet we, even with our own scientific devices and electronic marvels, can do something very close to this. We can show the whole world a version of life about five seconds after it takes place that is virtually error-free. Why do we doubt for a moment that God Himself has done this same thing? In other words, that God has previewed all our lives, and has pre-edited a version in Jesus that is absolutely perfect and victorious, and that you and I, at this moment, have the privilege of sitting before an editing machine and using our free wills to determine which version of our lives the world will see. See, loved ones, that's the only thing that makes sense of those mysterious verses that I've often quoted to you. I mean, what other sense can you make of that verse, if Christ has died for all, then all have died? Unless it means that in timeless eternity, where all things exist in God's mind before they actually take place here, God foreknew what we would each do with our free wills, and He put them into Jesus, and they died with Him. 
What other sense can you make of that mysterious verse in Ephesians? Those of us who were dead in our trespasses and sins, God has raised up and has made to sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What other sense can you make of that except that there is a version of your life and mine that has been pre-edited by God, that has been corrected in Jesus' death, and has been raised up and resurrected with him, and that is flawless and perfect, a perfect life that trusts in our Father perfectly. So really what it means, you see, is that there is a selfish version of your life and mine, a life produced by Satan and the powers of darkness. And there is also a version that has been produced by the resurrection power and purity of Jesus' life. And that each of us is able to decide which version will be manifested in our life today. If you say to me, well, well, how do you operate the editing machine in that situation? How do you determine which version? Oh, it's easy. Jesus settled the principle. He said, be it unto you according to your faith. According to whether you believe or disbelieve, that you were destroyed in Jesus' death and recreated new in his resurrection, according to whether you believe or disbelieve that at each moment and in each event of your life, so you determine which version of your life others see, and you determine which power you receive. You determine whether you receive the power from the old uncrucified life or whether you receive the power from the crucified and raised life. Now, loved ones, if you've grasped that, I'll ask you just to take one more big step in a way. And it's the step that comes up in this verse where it says, you remember, how the Scriptures described how Elijah pleaded with God against Israel. Really, only you can use your free will to determine which version of your life is manifested in this physical world. Only you can do that. That's true. You, you have the free will to do that. You're the only one can do that. And nobody can force you. Nobody can make you do it. That's true. But the incredible thing we get from this verse is that other people can release powerful, beneficial influences and forces upon your life by their own faith about you, by whether they believe the resurrected version of you in Jesus or whether they believe the absolutely uncrucified, filled with thought version outside Jesus. People can actually influence your life in miraculous ways. They can never make you a child of God. You know, they can't do that. They can't determine your eternal destiny. But they can affect tremendously by releasing the beneficial forces and influences that come from the version of your life that has been crucified and raised in Jesus by releasing that upon your life. And of course, the opposite is true, you see. That's where we come to today's verse, where Elijah pleaded with God against Israel. The opposite is true. You can release on others' lives all the power and the force of what Satan has done in their lives. You can release all the death of their uncrucified life upon them by praying them down. You can. If you see another person not in Christ, you see them as not in Christ, then you are really rejecting reality. 
because reality is God has put them in Christ. And the only reason they're going to miss heaven is because they reject that, not because he hasn't put them in Christ. So every time you see a person as not in Christ, you're rejecting reality, and you're driving that person more and more into the unreal dark world that stands apart from Jesus. Loved ones, you can actually pray people down. That's what this verse says. You remember how the Scripture said, Elijah pleaded with God against Israel. Every time you say to a loved one, you're a miserable failure. Every time you say to a loved one, I wish you were dead. Or strangely, every time you wish it. Because the old hymn says, prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed. Every time you desire evil against another person, every time you want another person to experience pain, every time you wish harm against another person, every time you reveal resentment against another person, every time you say to another person, you'll never get the money, you're a failure, and everybody sees you as a failure. Loved ones, every time you either say that kind of thing to a person, or every time you resent a person so much that you want harm to be done to them, and that you hate them and dislike them, you are praying that person down because prayer is the soul's sincere desire, and the spiritual world hears that prayer. Forget that stuff about psychic forces. Forget that silliness that when the people in India make effigies and stick pins into the effigy of their enemy, it's psychic forces. Forget that. You're not simply releasing psychic forces upon a person. You're not simply releasing the power of autosuggestion upon a person. Loved ones, you're releasing this dark side of Calvary with all its death, all its failure, all its inadequacy and its hopelessness. You're releasing that upon a person instead of releasing upon them the other side of Calvary, the resurrection side, the side where they have been made new and whole in Jesus and have been resurrected in power and full adequacy with him. Do you see, it's possible to pray a person down or it's possible to pray a person up. You see, loved ones, nothing to do with positive thinking. Positive thinking has no power at all. Positive thinking has no power. But believing and acting on the basis of the great reality that we have all been crucified with Christ and raised with him, believing that or disbelieving it, acting towards a person on the basis of it or apart from the basis of it, that releases real spiritual power, either from God's act or from the unredeemed act of Satan. So it makes a great difference the way you act towards each other and the way we act towards events and circumstances. If you see a wayward daughter in Jesus, made whole and clean, and living the way God wanted her to live, you release upon that loved one beneficial rays of the resurrection life that will draw her more and more towards what God wants for her. Every time you see her as she appears to the world in the midst of the fornication, in the midst of the selfishness and the greed, in the midst of the rebellion, and that's how you deal with her all the time, you release upon that loved one all the powers of what Satan has done to us human beings, all the powers of darkness and despair. In a financial situation, in your family or with your friends, and things are going bad, 
every time you deal with that financial situation as not being in Jesus, as not having been dealt with by God and transformed in Jesus, every time you see the knots that bind financial supply as having been untied and having been unresolved in Jesus, every time you see that financial situation or those financial circumstances from the dark side of Calvary, every time you talk to your loved ones that way, every time you're pessimistic about the finances, every time you're depressed and you say, we'll never get out of this, or no, we can't do that, every time you say that, you release the power of the dark satanic side of Calvary into that situation. You do. And every time you look at the financial situation and you cannot see a chink of light in the whole mess, and you look up to God and you say, Lord, I thank you that you put us all into Jesus, and you put all the frustrations of our life into him, and you destroyed them there, and you have recreated us anew, and we have been raised with him, and we sit with you at the right hand, and we are able to look down over every rule and dominion and power, and we have everything resolved by the power of Jesus' resurrection life. Every time you look at it that way, you release into that financial situation and into the bankers and the people that you deal with, the resurrection power of Calvary. Now, just one last thing. Maybe sometimes you say, well, I've done that at times, and nothing has happened. It's not our right to determine how God distributes the benefits of Christ's death and resurrection. That's not our right. Our responsibility is when Jesus comes to our village to believe that he can do any great work. It's up to him how he distributes the benefits of those great works. If he thinks that in a certain cancer situation, he can save the children of that home by allowing the dear dad to go and be with him, then that's his right. It's not for us to question how God distributes the benefits of Jesus' resurrection. But loved ones, it is our right to do one thing and one thing only, and that's see life in Jesus, crucified, destroyed, and resurrected and recreated anew. It is our responsibility to see constantly everything in our lives and all our loved ones in that upbeat, optimistic way that accords with good psychology. No, that's a game but that accords with the reality that all of us have been crucified with Christ and have been renewed, and there is a perfect version of our lives that is available to us at this moment. Now, you know, I don't care where you are in your own faith at this moment. You know fine well you can start this today. I mean, you know that. I don't care, you know, if you're a happy old agnostic sitting there not sure of whether Jesus died or not. You know you can understand this stuff. You can begin to act this way this very moment. You know you can. I mean, it's going to come up when you see that the gas tank's almost empty and the service stations are closed. <laughs> or if you get past that one, it's going to come up pretty soon, before six anyway this evening. And you know, loved ones, you can change the course of your own history by whether you believe that you and I were crucified with Christ with all our flaws and with all our inadequacies and our tangled, complex lives with all their problems and their difficulties were resolved in Jesus and God edited a new version and recreated a new version that is perfect and that is filled with power and that runs according to his will. We can believe that. We can choose which of those to believe. And the incredible thing is that you can mightily affect your husbands and your wives, your sons and your daughters. We can mightily affect our friends 
by what we wish upon them. Do you pray people up or do you pray people down? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we would certainly thank you for the truth that you reveal to us each Sunday. And we would thank you for the mystery and the mighty power of this truth that you have shown us today. And Lord, we see, looking back on our lives, that it's no wonder why they have gone the way they have. Lord, often we've just walked by sight, telling ourselves that we were being practical and pragmatic and commonsensical. But Lord, we've refused to walk with that optimistic faith that you had as you met the practical reality of the cross and of people's insults and opposition, and as you made tables and chairs to earn money for your mother and for the other brothers and sisters you had. Lord, we see that in the midst of all that pragmatism, you walked by faith and not by sight. You believed what our God has done for each one of us. And you walk, work, walked on the assumption that all that was available to us today by faith. So, Lord, we ask you to help each one of us from the very moment we end this service to begin to pray people up and to pray ourselves up and to pray our circumstances up and to begin to see things in Jesus renewed and recreated whole and perfect and from this day forward to treat each other in the light of that. We thank you, Lord, that love is always eager to believe the best. And we would love as you have loved. For your glory.